Taking you live to the Cato Institute for a discussion on Afghanistan about the challenges of achieving regional stability as well as the lasting policy impact of President Obama's troop surge. This is just getting underway. On May 21, 2002, Republican and Democratic lawmakers passed the Afghanistan Freedom Support Act, which pledged no less than four times, to advance the creation of a, quote, broad-based, multi-ethnic, gender-sensitive, and fully representative government in Afghanistan, unquote. Those goals were in keeping with the two, uh, December 2001 Bonn Agreement, in which the United States and the international community pledged to help, quote, end the tragic conflict in Afghanistan and promote reconciliation, lasting peace, stability, and respect for human rights in the country, unquote. Nearly 11 years later, amid a daily parade of reports detailing human rights abuses, bloody insurgent attacks, chronic political instability, and rampant petty and large-scale corruption, Afghanistan continues to face serious obstacles. What went wrong? One typically hears one of two responses. The first is that President George W. Bush squandered America's quick and easy victory. By both committing an insufficient number of troops in the beginning and redirecting America's energies to Iraq, his policies created a vacuum that enabled the Taliban to resurface. The second explanation for what went wrong is that President Barack Obama correctly shifted America's focus back to Afghanistan, but failed to fully resource the mission and wrongly fixed a date for ending combat involvement. Although both answers have a great deal of merit, the project to create a viable, centralized, and legitimate Afghan government may have been doomed to failure from the very beginning. Debates about the war in Afghanistan often mirror debates about the war in Iraq. We get wrapped up in procedural questions about planning and execution, and we appeal to counterfactuals of, if only we did this differently, or if only we did that differently. But we rarely challenge the underlying assumption that we could have ever promoted national reconciliation, lasting peace, or built a capable and popular government. In addition to what seems to be an unquestioned faith about our abilities in Afghanistan, both the Bush and Obama administrations promoted the belief that establishing rule of law, building infrastructure, growing an economy, eliminating corruption, and resolving disputes would somehow prevent another terrorist attack on American soil. The prevailing assumption that rebuilding Afghanistan and other failed states is necessary to cure the problem of terrorism is fallacious, costly, and ultimately Sisyphean. The United States and its coalition partners have pumped hundreds of billions of dollars into one of the world's poorest economies. That massive infusion of aid has exacerbated the conflict, created winners and losers by enriching petty elites, and among a host of other unintended consequences, inadvertently funded insurgents, with militants profiting from construction projects through protection rackets. The notion that enhancing political reform in Afghanistan increases US national security also fails to address the much simpler question, even if the Taliban reconquered Afghanistan and invited al-Qaeda back, how much of a threat would that pose to the United States? Can that threat be addressed without a costly, multi-decade, troop-heavy campaign? To help us answer these questions and the ultimate question of what went wrong, I am pleased to have on the dais with me today a distinguished panel of experts who will provide a broad cross-section of opinion. First, we have Rajiv Chandrasekharan, the senior correspondent and associate editor of The Washington Post. He is author of Little America, The War Within the War for Afghanistan. From 2009 to 2011, he traveled extensively through the southern provinces of Helmand and Kandahar to reveal the impact of President Barack Obama's decision to increase U.S. troop levels. He is also the author of Imperial Life in the Emerald City, a best-selling, award-winning, first-hand account of life inside Baghdad's Green Zone and the troubled American effort to reconstruct Iraq. He has served as the Washington Post's South Asia correspondent, Cairo Bureau Chief, Baghdad Bureau Chief, National Editor, and Assistant Managing Editor. Our next speaker will be Ambassador James Dobbins, the Director of the RAND International Security and Defense Policy Center. After the terrorist atrocities of September 11, 2001, Dobbins was named by the Bush administration's representative uh, to the Afghan opposition, and after the 9-11 attacks, was tasked with putting together and installing the successor to the Taliban regime. He re represented the United States at the Bonn Conference that established the new Afghan government, and on December 16, 2001, he raised the flag over the newly reopened U.S. Embassy. His diplomatic assignments include the withdrawal of American forces from Somalia, the American-led multilater multilateral intervention in Haiti, the stabilization and reconstruction of Bosnia, and the NATO intervention in Kosovo. Our final speaker will be Colonel Gian Gentile, 
An award-winning historian, associate professor of history, and director of the military history program at the US Academy at West Point. His 2008 article, Misreading the Surge, which, would, which appeared in the World Politics Review, first exposed a growing rift among military intellectuals about the implications of counterinsurgency doctrine on the US Army's conventional capabilities. He was among a small group of dissident officers and defense analysts who questioned the necessity and efficacy of using counterinsurgency in Afghanistan to destroy Al Qaeda. His forthcoming book, Wrong Turn, America's Deadly Embrace of Counterinsurgency, draws on his experiences as a combat battalion commander in Iraq and his research into the application of counterinsurgency in a variety of historical contexts. And with that, I turn the podium over to Rajiv. Malou, thanks for that very kind introduction. My apologies to all of you who might have come expecting a, a, a pointed debate between the Cato analyst and the Washington Post editor. Uh, there are actually many, many, many points of agreement between what she said and what I'm going to talk about uh, briefly here uh, in opening. Um, what went wrong? Where to start with Afghanistan? A um, couple of things. If, if we look at the 2009, 2001 to 2009 time frame, the common criticism, as Malou noted, is that the US took its eye off the ball in Afghanistan to focus on Iraq. That is true, and I'm not going to support the Iraq war by what I'm about to say, but there were two more even critical mistakes made by Washington and our allies, in my view, that were only tangentially related to the invasion of Iraq. The first is the Afghan constitution. In the name of fighting corruption and promoting modernization, it centralized power in Kabul to an absurd degree. Karzai, uh, has the ability to hire and fire district governors and police chiefs. And on paper, the Constitution aggregates power in the capital to a degree unseen in any other country on the planet, perhaps save for North Korea. The United States um, should have used its ample influence in the early years of the war, and, and this is not by any stretch of the imagination a, a criticism of Ambassador Dobbins, who did phenomenal work <laughs> in the transitionary period, and, and this, was, this, this is really a, a set of issues that occurred after his tenure, but we should have used our ample influence in the early years of the war to push, for, to push the Afghans to, to change their constitution, to draft it in a way that would be more in keeping with the country's traditions of decentralization. Our failure to do this, when we had the leverage to do so, provided the enabling framework for Karzai and other political elites. Actually, let's call them what they are, warlords and power brokers. It provided the framework for them to establish the kleptocracy that is the single largest threat to the stability of Afghanistan. The second is our failure to help Karzai in the early days of the war. Back in 2002, President Karzai did try to do the right things. He wanted to take on the warlords and establish a more technocratic government. But when he asked Washington for, uh, to authorize the deployment of NATO forces beyond Kabul to other major Afghan cities, he was told no. Defense Secretary Don Rumsfeld didn't want to commit additional US soldiers to the country. Uh, when Karzai asked the US military later in 2002 for help to remove a, a warlord turned governor in western Afghanistan who was enriching himself through smuggling, he, uh, and Karzai argued to Washington that doing so was essential to establishing the authority of the central government, the request was rejected on the grounds that US troops were not to engage on what was being called green on green activity, even if one side was the president on whom our nation was depending. Since we weren't going to provide the muscle to remove the warlords, Karzai engaged over the following years in a rational act of self-preservation. He cozied up to them. By the time we and our NATO partners got wise about the damage the warlords were wreaking across the country, Karzai had firmly moved into their camp. Now let's fast forward quickly to 2009. You all know the stakes. Obama had campaigned on Afghanistan being the good war. He endorsed a counterinsurgency strategy for Afghanistan in the early weeks of his first term without much of a substantive discussion. General Stan McChrystal told him that if he didn't commit to a surge, defeating the Taliban would no longer be possible. You all know what Obama did. 30,000 more troops, but with a deadline. The first troops would have to start coming home within two years a date the president took from the military's own planning documents that promised that areas could be cleared of insurgents and turned over to the Afghan security forces within just 18 to 24 months. What went wrong? Let's break it into two levels. The first is strategic. That is, was the coin strategy and the surge the right decision? The second is operational. That is, once the president signed off on the coin strategy and the troop surge, how well did the organs of his government, the Pentagon, the State Department, USAID, even Obama's own White House, how well did they implement his policy? Let's start with strategy, if we could. And let me state up front that I believe coin can work if the conditions are right and the cost is merited. But for COIN to prevail in Afghanistan, several things needed to occur. The Afghan government had to be a willing partner. 
The Pakistani government had to be willing to crack down on insurgent sanctuaries on its own soil. The US government had to be willing to commit troops and money for several years. And the American people had to be patient enough for security to improve gradually. First, let's talk about the Afghan government. Karzai never agreed with the US war strategy. Isn't having a supportive, credible host nation government a fundamental prerequisite for counterinsurgency? We know most Afghans have no great love for the Taliban. They view the Talibs as the religious zealots that they are. And the Afghan people know well what it was like to live under the Taliban. But it turns out they have no great love for their own government either. It's because Karzai's government in many places is filled with warlords and corrupt scoundrels, many of whom don't provide basic services to the population. Of course, the answer in Washington has been coin. If only, the thinking goes, we can build institutions of subnational governance and we can connect those institutions on to the provincial capital and then on up to the national capital, we can fix this mess. It was such an appealing idea, but it was fundamentally flawed. That's because Karzai has no interest in letting us succeed. Because if we did, it would disrupt his patronage networks and the deals he's cut with regional power brokers. So he undercut reformers, and he slow rolled efforts to build up institutions of local governance. We Americans, or the US government, naively assumed back in 2009 and 10 that the failure to get civil servants down to the districts was because of a lack of human capacity. Sure, that was a problem, but the bigger problem was that Karzai simply didn't believe in the venture. And he had his ministers interfere with the process even when the United States was footing the bill. Pakistani government, real quickly on this one, after the Taliban leadership relocated uh, to Pakistan uh, after the, the, uh, the commencement of military action in Afghanistan in 2001, they were given a degree of safe harbor by Pakistan's intelligence service, the ISI. But back then, uh, in the early years of the conflict, the Pakistanis uh, refrained from giving the Talibs overt assistance. They were allowed to meet, reorganize, they could raise their own money and whatnot, but, but they weren't getting a lot of direct help. Uh, when we decided to surge troops, all that changed. Um, by, by late 2009, uh, the Talibs were getting uh, substantial amounts of both money, uh, intelligence, and other materiel via civilian inter intermediaries from the Pakistani military. Uh, by one assessment, by the spring of 2011, at least half of all insurgent commanders were working closely with ISI operatives. Uh, the domestic front, the price tag, was it worth it? You know, it costs about, on average, $1 million to keep one American service member in Afghanistan for a single year. That means that the annual tab for the war in 2010 and 2011 was about $100 billion. Is achieving a marginally less bad outcome in Afghanistan worth that expense? Uh, and what about the Afghan army? You know, instead of compelling Afghan soldiers into action, the surge, in many cases, sent the opposite message. The Afghans often decided to hang back and let US troops do the fighting. What was supposed to be a good kick in the pants, or at least a golden opportunity to work in tandem with the Americans, instead turned into a crutch. Now, despite all those coin assumptions that turned out to be false, our troops have made remarkable progress over the past three years. Parts of southern Afghanistan that were once teeming with insurgents are now largely peaceful. Schools have reopened, as have bazaars. People are living as close to a normal life as possible in some parts of the, the southern part of the country. But those changes, but are those changes really because of a troop surge or the, the result of, uh, of the, the military's use, pardon me, of counterterrorism tactics advocated by Vice President Biden during the White House surge debate? Starting in mid-2010, there was a huge increase in special operations night raids to target key Taliban leaders. Use of airstrikes and artillery also multiplied. In short, the Talibs got a gloves-off thrashing. But Afghanistan as a whole, as we know so well, is not fully secure. Eastern parts of the country are still in the grip of a Taliban faction backed by the ISI. And in the South, the critical question lingers. Will the Afghans, will their government, their army, their police force, have the willingness and ability to take the baton from American troops as we begin coming home? Will the Afghans sustain the gains? Will all of that blood and treasure we have expended have been worth it? Or will all this slip back to chaos? I don't think that means the Talibs are going to be able to roll into Kabul with the same ease as they did in the 1990s. I don't think the Kabul government's going to fall like Saigon's did. The Afghan army, it appears, is going to be strong enough to hold on to major population centers and some key lines of communication. But the insurgents will almost certainly expand their control of rural districts and valleys. And they'll retain the ability to conduct frequent spectacular attacks against government and civilian targets, just like we saw in Farah earlier this week. The foreseeable future is going to be messy and chaotic, but many Americans may well see it as good enough. Osama's dead. The Al-Qaeda leadership is on the ropes. The Talib is, Talibs have taken a beating. 
But could all of that have occurred without a surge? Could we have achieved a similar messy but good enough outcome without hundreds more Americans dead and thousands more seriously wounded? Um, before I sit down, I want to just turn quickly to the question of how the surge was executed. I've talked briefly about the strategic disconnect. Now I want to address the operational failure. Agree or disagree, the surge was the president's strategy, and the government beneath him had an obligation to make their best efforts to implement it. But each part of our government made critical errors, and I'll just tick off a couple of them. The first is the Pentagon. Back in 2009, in the summer of 2009, um, the, the most at-risk part of the country was the southern city of Kandahar. It was the strategic prize for the Taliban. If they could have seized Kandahar, they would have had a crucial foothold to take over much of the rest of the country, as they did in the 1990s. Um, so, and they were, they were literally sort of passing uh, in the areas around Kandahar at that time. So you would think we would have devoted the bulk of that first wave of new troops to the areas in and around Kandahar to protect it. No, we sent those troops, it was a large US Marine Brigade, we sent them off to the deserts of neighboring Helmand province, home to fewer than 1% of Afghanistan's population. Why? Uh, the short answer is tribal rivalries. Not in Afghanistan, but in the Pentagon. That brigade was composed of US Marines. They wanted to fight with their own aviation assets, their own intelligence assets, their own logistics assets. Um, and so they literally needed their own patch of the sandbox. And instead of working to integrate them with US and Canadian Army units that were already operating in the areas around Kandahar, top commanders in Kabul, as well as um, uh, top officials back in the Pentagon simply chose the path of least resistance and gave them a part of Afghanistan that wasn't really home to a whole lot of people. There were bad guys there to kill, but really if our strategy was coined, we should have been near a key population center. Uh, the civilian surge it was supposed to occur in tandem with the military surge to place more diplomats and reconstruction workers uh, down there in the field with our combat battalions to help provide governance, uh, uh, services to help uh, engage in basic reconstruction. Put aside whether the whole notion of subnational governance was a good idea or not, it was the strategy. And so the civilian organs of our government was, were supposed to send individuals down to work with our military commanders. Problem was the civilian surge unfolded about a year too late. Um, the, the bulk of the people didn't start flowing in until well after the, the first waves of military forces arrived. And then the bulk of them wound up staying in the rather comfortable embassy compound in Kabul with its swimming pool and bar, uh, as opposed to getting out into the dusty, dangerous forward operating bases where they were most desperately needed. Um, and some of this really was just a failure of imagination on the part of those doing the hiring. Instead of scouring the country for the right people to fill these jobs, they instead um, uh, just waited for resumes to come in over the transom. Uh, often were from contractors who had worked on wasteful projects in Iraq, uh, coming for uh, yet more uh, lucrative employment in Afghanistan. Uh, yes, Afghanistan has very uh, dire needs, uh, rates of malnutrition, infant mortality, illiteracy, they're all off the charts. Afghanistan's one of the poorest countries on the planet, and the country was starved of assistance in the initial years of the war. But um, there is such a thing as trying to do too much of a good thing. Uh, you know, I guess the best analogy is, for, to me is, you know, think of Afghanistan as a parched man on a hot day. What he really needs is a tall glass of cold water. Uh, but in the name of trying to get Afghanistan right, the Obama administration back in 2009, 10, and 11 literally turned a fire hose on Afghanistan. We tried to spend $4 billion in 2010 on reconstruction projects in that country. It, it far exceeded the absorptive capacity of the country. You know, in, in, in districts in southern Afghanistan, it equated to more money per capita than, uh, or more money um, than the per capita income for every man, woman, and child in those places. Not surprisingly, it wound up fueling the very corruption we were trying to, to, to stem uh, in Kabul. Um, and, and lastly, um, the, the sort of the war within the war. I, I, in my travels back and forth to Afghanistan, I discovered that it wasn't just uh, the fighting over there. There's was, there was also a huge degree of bureaucratic infighting here in Washington. And the most pitched battle um, that I uh, kind of came upon was that between the State Department and, uh, and the White House over the, the, the subject of reconciliation with the Taliban. There was no substantive policy disagreement. State and the White House both favored uh, trying to, to lay a framework to get to eventual negotiations with the Taliban, uh, uh, reasoning that uh, the only way this conflict was going to be to, it was going to end in any reasonable way was across a negotiating table that you weren't ever going to be able to kill every last single Talib. But State's point man for this was Richard Holbrook, 
And uh, you know, he was a guy who, who, who had some eminent qualifications. Uh, he, he helped broker the Dayton Peace Accords. He'd served in the US delegation to the Paris Peace Talks, aimed at ending the Vietnam War. But he was also a, a, a guy with really sharp elbows, a big ego, and a very dramatic personality that didn't go down so well in a White House run by a president nicknamed No Drama Obama. And so you had uh, White House NSC officials uh, deliberately uh, scheduling key meetings when he was out of town, denying him the use of aircraft. Um, the bottom line here was that we squandered the, the first year of the surge, the year that we had the most leverage because we were putting in troops. We squandered the best opportunity we had to try to chart a path toward possible peace talks with the Taliban because senior officials in Washington were far more consumed with fighting one another than, than rowing in tandem to try to, to get to the, the right objective. Just in closing, what should the president have done back in 2009? I'm not one of those who think we should have simply packed up and left. Had we done that, or even if we do that today, it likely would condemn the Afghans to the hell of a prolonged insurgency or another civil war. We still, in my view, have a moral obligation to the Afghan people. When we launched the war in 2001, we made an implicit promise to them that if they stood with us against the Taliban, we'd give them a shot at a better, freer life. But that didn't require a coin strategy and a surge that tired us out. One of the main characters in my Afghanistan book, a brave State Department officer named Cale Weston, who spent seven years in Iraq and Afghanistan, more than any other American diplomat, argued that instead of going big with a surge or packing up and going home, we Americans should have gone long. The president needed to determine how many troops he was going to be willing to commit to Afghanistan, perhaps for 10 years, and then he needed to pledge that level of support to the Afghan people. That would have meant no surge, probably would have meant troop reductions back in 2009. But Cale Weston was convinced that a smaller but more enduring force would be smarter on all fronts. It would appeal to the Afghans, who chafed at the presence of so many foreign soldiers on their soil. It would compel the Afghan army to more quickly assume responsibility for fighting the Taliban. And it would force the Americans to focus only on the most essential missions instead of grand nation-building projects. Afghanistan, he often told me, is a marathon, not a sprint. The surge was a sprint, and we got winded too quickly. Surging was the easy thing to do, he said. It's much harder to say no. Thank you. Well, again, thanks for uh, inviting me to this. Um, I think there's a good deal of uh, agreement between myself and the previous speakers, but I think uh, the, uh, I have a somewhat different emphasis. Um, and uh, tend to come uh, look at most glasses as half uh, full rather than half empty. Um, I do want to get to what we've done wrong and what went wrong in Afghanistan, but I think it, it might be useful just to start off with what, uh, what's gone right. Um, since 2001, Afghanistan's uh, GDP has gone up uh, by, uh, has, has, has gone up five times, five times bigger than it was. In 2001, there were 700,000 uh, children in school. Today, there are 8 million, of whom about a third are girls. There were even 77,000 university students in Afghanistan. Um, as the result of that, literacy, which was, I think, around 15% in 2001, is already up at 35%. 10 years from now, more than half of Afghans will be able to read and write, 55% in 10 years, and 80% in 20 years. Um, about 60% of Afghans currently have access to very basic health care. The result is that uh, longevity has gone up from 44, 44 years life expectancy in 2001 to 60 years life expectancy today. Maternal mortality, that is women dying in childbirth, has been reduced by 80%. Child mortality uh, is down by 44%. Um, Afghans have access to a, a vibrant uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and numerous media with hundreds of radio stations, dozens of private, uh, privately owned TV stations. About 60% of Afghans today have access in some way to television. 95% of them listen to the radio. And rather remarkably, given that no Afghans had a telephone in 2001, two-thirds of Afghan households currently have telephones. Um, the result is uh, an Afghan um, public that's a lot more optimistic about their future than we tend to be about their future. In fact, they're a lot more optimistic about their future than we are about our future. 
Um, in the recent opinion poll, 52% of Afghans uh, uh, thought that uh, that uh, the future would be better than the than the past and better than their current situation. They were optimistic. This is up from 46% a year earlier. Um, if you ask the Afghans the classic Ronald Reagan uh, question, are you better off today than you were four years ago, 53% of them say yes. I think in the United States it's around 15%. <laughs> um, uh, Afghans, rather surprisingly, have uh, high degrees of confidence in their army, 93%. Police force, 82 percent. Government, 75 percent. Um, now, a lot of people say, well, they're just giving answers to the questions that they think uh, that you want to hear or that the government wants to hear. But the same polls show very high degrees of uh, concern about corruption and very clear criticisms uh, of the government against those more general backgrounds. Now, we started off by uh, listing our aspirations for Afghanistan in very broad terms. And I think if you if you always uh, measured achievement by aspiration, you'd almost always come up short. 10 years after the American Revolution, you'd have to declare it a failure because we hadn't created a society with the central promise of the Declaration of Independence, which was that all men were created equal. It took us 100 years to get rid of slavery. It took us 150 years to allow women to vote. And we're still fighting over some of these basic issues of equality today. So, so no, we haven't met the, many of those aspirations. But it's, it's, it, we, did, we just finished a, a, a study at the Rand Corporation where we took 20 societies in which there have been military interventions of a peacekeeping or peace enforcement sort since the end of the Cold War. These include all the big American ones, Somalia, Haiti, Bosnia, Kosovo, Afghanistan, and Iraq, but also a dozen or more smaller UN uh, peacekeeping operations. And we measured uh, progress in all of these over a 10-year period using internationally recognized indices. So we used Freedom House measurements to decide how much improvement in democratization there, there will be. Freedom House rates every country in the world every year. It gives them a numerical rating. Um, we used uh, UN um, development program ratings for human development, which is a rating that's based on the degree of education and health and standard of living in the country. We used the World Bank ratings for government effectiveness. How effective was the government? Uh, and, we used, uh, uh, and we used IMF figures for economic growth uh, across these 20 societies where there had been military interventions in the context of post, post, uh, ideally post-conflict environments. Uh, of the 20, uh, Afghanistan on democratization was about in the middle, a 15% improvement in democratization uh, over that 10-year period. In terms of economic growth, it was second from the top. Uh, in terms of government effectiveness, rather remarkably, it was second from the top. Now, these are rates of improvement, not absolute achievements. Uh, and in human development, it was the top of all 20 countries. So, so there have been things that have gone right in Afghanistan. But of those 20 societies, 16 are at peace today. So 16 of those 20 interventions succeeded in bringing enduring peace. Uh, and Afghanistan is one of the ones that didn't. And after all, that's a central failure in any kind of peace operation. Um, and, and so what did we do wrong? Well, I think in the 1990s, in the course of the Clinton administration, we learned something about nation building, post-conflict intervention, reconstruction, stabilization operations, whatever terminology you want to use. Um, and we basically learned, uh, I think, three uh, big lessons, particularly after the initial failure in Somalia, which was a complete catastrophe. You know, lesson one was go in big. Don't dribble your forces in. Don't be incremental. Deploy a large, impressive peacekeeping force, establish security, and then draw the force down once you've deterred the emergence of any violent resistance movement. Uh, secondly, recognize that in the aftermath of a conflict, the indigenous institutions for public security will have been disintegrated or discredited by reason of their prior <coughs> behavior um, or totally destroyed. And as a result, you, the intervening party, are going to have to assume responsibility for public safety, for policing, for some interval until uh, indigenous institutions can be restored that can take over those responsibilities. 
Uh, and thirdly, you need to involve the neighboring societies in your project, not in the peacekeeping element of it, but in the political aspects of the project. Because if, if they feel that your project, the society you're trying to build or rebuild, is not in their interest, they will have, by reason of their proximity, by reason of their commercial, familial, religious, ideological, uh, tribal connections, the ability to subvert your effort. Uh, the classic case of that is when we brought peace to, to uh, Bosnia, we invited Milosevic and Tujman, the presidents of Croatia and Serbia, both of them personally guilty of the genocide we were trying to stop, to the peace conference. And we involved them in implementing that peace conference. If we'd taken the uh, view that they were war criminals and we weren't going to talk to them, they'd still be fighting in Bosnia. So this is the classic case of making sure the neighbors are brought into the project. The Bush administration came into office. They'd been in opposition throughout the 90s. The job of the opposition is to oppose. They opposed all of the Clinton interventions. Um, uh, and they criticized them. And they criticized the whole project of nation building. Um, and during the, uh, the three debates that Gore and, uh, uh, and uh, Bush had leading up to the presidential election, the only foreign policy issue that was discussed in all three of those debates was nation building. Happy days when the only thing, the only foreign policy that, that the presidential candidates had to discuss was whether or not to send peacekeeping forces into post-conflict societies. But that was it. And Bush said he wasn't going to do this anymore. And then, of course, uh, in his first three years in office, he invaded three new countries. So he went into uh, Afghanistan in 2001, into Iraq in 2003. And by the way, we probably forget, but in 2004, US troops went back into Haiti yet again. Mm. So the Bush administration felt compelled to do nation building, although they didn't call it that, even though they promised not to do it. And so they were determined to do it very differently. They weren't going to learn any of the lessons that the Clinton administration had absorbed. They were going to, to approach this fundamentally differently. And Don Rumsfeld explained what he called the small footprint, low profile approach to nation building by arguing that in having flooded Bosnia and Kosovo with international military manpower and economic assistance, we had made those two societies, we had turned those two societies into permanent wards of the international community. And we were going to avoid doing that in Afghanistan and Iraq by absolutely minimizing those kinds of commitments, by putting in the smallest number of men and the smallest number amount of money possible so that Afghanistan and then Iraq would become self-sufficient more quickly. Uh, this was, in effect, a transposition of the 1990s debate over US welfare reform to the international realm. And the analogy could not have proved more inept. The strategy of reinforcing a military operation only under failure, of making a minimal commitment and then raising it only once your initial commitment had shown to be inadequate, only after you were facing defeat on the battlefield, turned out to be an absolutely terrible way of resourcing and, an, and a vastly more expensive way of resourcing these. So the first mistake that we made was inadequately resourcing Afghanistan. If you compare initial resource uh, for uh, Bosnia and Afghanistan, for instance, the average Bosnian in the first couple of years after the war got $800 a year in international assistance. In Afghanistan, it was $50 a year. So in other words, Bosnia on a per capita basis got 16 times more assistance than Afghanistan. If you look at the amount of international military forces that were committed to security, then you, the number is even more striking. The, we put 60,000 troops, we, the NATO, put 60,000 troops into Bosnia, a society of only 3 million people. At the end of 2002, a year after we'd driven the Taliban off, we had a total of 8,000 American troops in Afghanistan, a society of 50 million people. The size of the stabilization force in, Af in Bosnia was literally, on a per capita basis, 50 times bigger than the size of the stabilization force in Afghanistan for the first couple of years. So lowest level of resource commitment of any American post-conflict reconstruction effort since 1945 was what Afghanistan was those first se several years. Secondly, we had a strong international coalition going into, Af going into Afghanistan in 2001. Pakistan withdrew its support from the Taliban. Iran cooperated with us quite closely in the diplomacy leading to the creation of a new Afghan government and offered further assistance uh, in the aftermath of the installation of the Karzai government. 
uh, and the administration's response was to put Iran on the axis of evil list uh, and to allow the ta Pakistanis to resume their assistance to the Taliban. So we, we, we left, uh, ignored lesson two. In terms of establishing public security, the Bush administration took the position that US troops in Afghanistan would do no peacekeeping and neither would anybody else. They allowed a, a small peacekeeping force to go into Kabul because the Afghans insisted on it. They refused the, the pleas both from Karzai and from the UN to expand that peacekeeping force to the rest of the country. And they took the position that US troops in the rest of the country would not do peacekeeping. Uh, the result was we turned security throughout a society of 70 million to the Afghans, a society that had no army and no police force. So I think it's, it's not remarkable that things deteriorated, that the, Af that the pa Taliban was able to reconstitute itself, to recruit, uh, to refinance, to reorganize, and to begin to project power from Pakistani sanctuaries back into Afghanistan. And uh, the United States responded in dribs uh, and drabs over the years. We tend to say that, that this is the longest war we've ever fought. Um, if you look at the major wars, it's also uh, the least costly um, uh, in terms, certainly in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, uh, military manpower. The level of casualties in Afghanistan is not only smaller than Iraq, but it's much smaller than Vietnam or Korea or World War I or World War II. Um, uh, uh, and as a practical matter, the serious fighting has only gone on for the last four or five years. Um, we did another study at Rand which looked at what, what are the prospects for winning a counterinsurgency. And there are a number of elements that have to be in place to give you a reasonable prospect of winning a counterinsurgency campaign. Once you have all of those elements in place, which are not just resource elements, they're also policy elements, doctrinal elements. Once you have them all in place, it usually takes about seven years for them to actually turn the tide and begin to definitively defeat the enemy. Well, I don't think anybody would argue we had those elements in place any time before 2009, 2010 uh, in Afghanistan. So I think one has to put in some perspective the concern that this is the longest war we've ever fought, and we're getting tired of it, and we have to leave. Um, Nevertheless, I think things have gone wrong. I, I, I don't disagree with um, many of the more tactical points that Raj uh, made about the deficiencies in the surge uh, as defined by, uh, uh, as, as implemented by the Obama administration. Um, I do think that um, we need to stay uh, committed in Afghanistan. Uh, I think we're going to be committed at much lower levels of manpower and money. Um, uh, I, I, I think the intent is to have reduced uh, the force to something like somewhere in the area of eight to 15,000, uh, I think with the lower level being the more likely level in terms of American troop levels after uh, 2014. Uh, but I do think a, a, a continued commitment of that sort is going to be necessary. I don't see, you've got several transitions coming in 2014. One is the transition from American combat operations to Afghan combat operations. The other transition is from Karzai-led Afghanistan to somebody else-led Afghanistan. The second of those transitions is by far the more delicate, the more difficult, and the more decisive. The Afghan army is not going to run away in 2014. Uh, but the Afghan government could begin to disintegrate if the elections go badly, if they're indecisive, um, if they're divisive rather than bringing the country together. Um, but assuming those go reasonably well, um, I believe the kind of progress that we've seen and that I've, that I've suggested from these statistics can be sustained. Thanks to Malou and the Cato Institute for putting this panel together. I also, I have to start off with, um, I was going to ask Malou to do this, but I forgot. But I have to start off with a disclaimer that says the views that I'm um, about to um, present to you are mine and not necessarily those uh, of the U.S. government or the Department of Defense. So now, having said that, let me... Um, I am a serving army colonel and I teach history at West Point and I consider myself to be a student of history. And so 
if you don't mind, I'd like to start off um, with some history and to um, talk about um, the, the American war in Vietnam and pose this question of what went wrong for this panel in Afghanistan um, to the question that people were asking um, shortly after the United States lost its first war in Vietnam as to what went wrong um, with the war in Vietnam and more specifically, why did the United States lose the war in Vietnam? Um, and what came to be, I think, understood is that the reason why, I think the right answer for why or what went wrong in Vietnam and why the United States lost was that the United States lost the war because it failed at strategy. And strategy in the Vietnam War should have discerned very early on that the war was unwinnable based on a moral and material cost that the American people were willing to pay. I think strategy also failed to appreciate in the post-World War II world, the very real limits of American military power and what it could accomplish when it tried to do nation building um, at the barrel of a gun. And also what I think uh, strategy failed to understand, especially the military's side of, 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 of bringing together a strategy, was this, and I think also policy and the American people shared this mistaken belief that in any war that the United States commits itself to, military power or war will work. As long as the operations are done correctly, war can work. Um, these were, I think, the real lessons um, that came out of the, uh, the Vietnam and answered the question, what went wrong? What went wrong was a failure of US strategy. But you see, what started to happen in the 1970s and especially in the 1980s, this basic insight, I'm gonna tie all this to Afghanistan in a minute. This basic insight as to what went wrong in Vietnam, namely that the United States failed its strategy, started to get buried by a different explanation that said what went wrong in Vietnam was the way the war was fought. In this line of thinking, the United States lost the war in Vietnam, not because it didn't get strategy or policy right, but because it didn't fight the war in the correct way. So there's a big difference there, is the way the war was fought. And one of the first to make this argument was a man, an army colonel named Harry Summers, who in 1982 came out with a book titled On Strategy. And Harry Summers said, the United States could have won the war in Vietnam if it wouldn't have focused on counterinsurgency and directed its efforts toward fighting the North Vietnamese um, Army and the Viet Cong main force units. That was the correct way to fight the war, according to Harry Summers. Um, and then a few years later, in 1988, um, a different, really actually an opposite argument, but still this, this, the same coin, although a different side, right, um, was starting to be put forward. And this argument was um, uh, uh, first laid out um, by a, a, a man named Andrew Krepenovich in his book, The Army in Vietnam. And Krepenovich argued, again, like Harry Summers, only different, the war could have been won if it would have been fought correctly. And Krepenovich argued that if the United States had not focused on heavy use of firepower and instead concentrated on winning the hearts and minds of the South Vietnamese people, or in other words, done counterinsurgency correctly, the war could have been won. And in the 1990s, this explanation really becomes the prominent one. And it is shown in books like John Noggle, John Noggle's book, Learning to Eat Soup with a Knife, Lewis Sorley's A Better War, and H.R. McMaster's Dereliction of Duty. Now, now this, the reason why I start with this Vietnam analogy is because out of this latter explanation comes a story um, that was built around counterinsurgency warfare. Call it a narrative. Call it the counterinsurgency narrative. And this narrative said that counterinsurgency wars, like the United States and Vietnam, or the war in Iraq, America's second war in Iraq, or the war in Afghanistan, can be won as long as the army and the military fights it correctly, and the way it fights it correctly is by bringing better savior generals on board to transform their armies and get them doing the process, the procedures, and the tactics of counterinsurgency correctly. Which brings us to Iraq in 2006. And so after three bloody years of American occupation, people started to ask the same question again. What went wrong or what has gone wrong in Iraq? And the answer very quickly becomes bad tactics, 
and bad generals. And the solution is get a savior general on board, and he soon arrives onto the scene, and his name was General David Petraeus, with the surge of troops, who would turn his army around, get it doing the tactics of counterinsurgency correctly, and the war could be put on a path to success. Now, what brought about lowered levels of violence in Iraq by the end of 2007 had to do with a lot of other things. But this belief that by turning the tactical approach of the army around, as done by a savior general, this kind of thing can put these wars of counterinsurgency on the path to success, which then brings us to, or brings me to the war in Afghanistan in 2009. People asked again, well, we've been here since 2002, and now it's 2009, what has gone wrong? And again, we get the same answer, bad tactics, bad generals, and the solution, the answer, is to tweak the tactics, get the army to do counterinsurgency correctly, bring an enlightened general on board, and this time his name was Stanley McChrystal, and the war will be put on the path to success. But the solution in Afghanistan, I think, these are my views, just like in Vietnam and just like in Iraq, has never been about the tactical use of military force or better generals replacing bad generals. This is the myth that many people have come to believe, but that's not the reality of it. The solution or the answer to this question of what has gone wrong with the war in Afghanistan, in my view, is strategy. And let me, let me define what I mean when I say strategy. And it's a very much informed by uh, uh, Clausewitz. Um, and it's a, it's a simple explanation, but, but I think it's useful. In, in war, strategy sits in the middle of two other things or planes, right? Um, on this side over here is policy, which puts war into place and gives its, its overall purpose. And then over here, are the resources of war, oftentimes the tactical application of military force. And if strategy is done right, it looks to policy to see what the purpose of the war is for, and then it applies the resources of war to achieve policy aims with the least amount of blood and treasure spent to achieve uh, that policy aim. So when I say strategy, that's the de definition that, I, that I'm using in that, uh, uh, for strategy. And U.S. strategy in Afghanistan, I think, has been botched from the start. Not from 2009, but all the way back to 2002 when the United States committed itself to a nation-building campaign. The core policy for the United States in Afghanistan, and when, it, and when I say core policy, I mean what is the primary purpose for the United States military in Afghanistan? The core policy in Afghanistan, as stated by senior generals, secretaries of state, secretaries of defense, both presidents. I mean, I've gone through and I've read the uh, unclassified uh, testimony to both the House Armed Services, Senate Armed Services, from 2002 all the way up to the present. And when commanding generals, undersecretaries of defense, whomever, were asked by senators or congressmen, what are we doing in Afghanistan? Why are we there? The answer in one sentence has always been the destruction of Al Qaeda, period. Period, the destruction of Al Qaeda. Now, if you think about it, this is a very, very limited core policy aim. But since 2002, the United States has sought to use a maximalist operational method Called, called armed nation building, which American counterinsurgency is one and the same thing, to achieve this very limited core policy aim. And, and I ask myself why. And I think it's because of this rock solid belief that war, American war, can always be made to work. You see why this narrative, this counterinsurgency narrative that I talked about a few minutes ago is so important and so dangerous? Because war, in this view, can always be made to work as long as the tactics are tweaked and the better general is brought into place. It's also become very, very hard to break out of this idea that the only way to achieve our limited core policy aims in Afghanistan is by doing armed nation building because of this idea also that I think Rajiv mentioned of this moral commitment, sunk cost. But with that, 
How are we ever going to be able to stand back and look at this objectively and ask what is the right approach or the right strategy for the United States to have taken um, in Afghanistan? And in my view, strategy hasn't worked in Iraq and Afghanistan. And let's look at the cost very quickly. Um, because I think you need to look at both of these together. First with Iraq. Um, Ambassador Dobbins certainly mentioned uh, some of the, uh, the better things that have come out of specifically the war in Afghanistan. But let me set that within a another set of, of figures and statistics. With Iraq. After 8.8 .8 years of war, 4,886 Americans killed, thousands more with life-changing wounds. Depending on which estimate you, you, you want to take, close to $3 trillion American dollars spent. Iraq itself, close to a quarter of a million Iraqis killed. That many more seriously wounded, close to a million displaced from their original homes. Very few have returned. We've replaced one strong arm leader with another. This one, Nuri al-Maliki, is allied closely with our regional adversary, Iran. Then we look at Afghanistan. Close to 2,200 Americans killed, uh, that many more seriously wounded, close to a trillion dollars spent, um, tens of thousands of Afghans killed. I, often, I know this is, I often ask myself, this, it's a counterfactual or historical hypothetical. And I ask this just to try to set in context what these wars have cost relative to what we've achieved. And I ask myself, if the United States had gone into Iraq, like it did um, in 2003, um, and in Afghanistan in 2002, and then left, would the cost of the war, the levels of destruction and, every, and everything else, been any worse than what actually happened um, uh, between um, uh, uh, 2003 and 2011 in Iraq and still ongoing in Afghanistan. If, as the uh, very famous British strategist B.H. Little Hart said in the 1930s, the object of war is a better state of peace. With this kind of data that I just laid out, how can we say American war has worked in Afghanistan and Iraq. Now, this is not to say that we haven't achieved tactical success. I can point to success of my own cavalry squadron in West Baghdad in 2006, as can others. But in all of this, tactical success is supposed to lead up to something. So with that, I'll close by just doing it posing a derivative question to the one of what went wrong in Afghanistan, and I'll ask this question. Where is the better peace that this decade of two costly wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, where is it, um, this, this better peace that was supposed to have been produced? Thank you so much to our speakers. Um, I think I'll begin with a question uh, just for the panel. And you can all just sort of decide who wants to go first, I guess. Um, do you think that the lesson from both Iraq and Afghanistan, for that matter, Vietnam, uh, as the Colonel pointed out, that the lesson isn't to be that we should be relearning the lessons of counterinsurgency and armed nation building and knowing how best to set up, um, you know, reconstruction operations and development programs. Maybe the lesson is to avoid those sorts of conflicts. We have the finest military in the world. We are a global superpower. We can make these choices. We have the ability to make these choices, and yet we have routinely find ourselves in these situations. Um, would anyone like to? This is, again, a strategy question, not a tactical question. You can, you can answer from, the, from your seats. Um, well, I, I think, you know, it, it tends to be somewhat situationally dependent. Um, you know, punitive strikes can dissuade or threat of punitive strikes not followed up by any uh, further uh, intervention, you know, can dissuade... Uh, can either punish or potentially deter governments from uh, perpetrating certain acts. But punitive strikes can't stop genocide. They can't stop nuclear proliferation, uh, as far as we've seen so far. Uh, they can't stop uh, in, uh, sectarian conflict. They can't stop civil wars. They can't stop terrorists. Um, uh, so, so pure punitive strikes as a way of punishing regimes you don't like have limited utility. If you're not going to take responsibility for shaping 
the post-conflict environment in ways that improve it over the pre-conflict environment, then you're likely to have at most very uh, short-lived uh, success. I mean, uh, uh, John uh, asked, you know, what would Afghanistan have been like if we left? And, and it's, I think it's easy to, that answer, that answer is easy. It would have been like it was in the early 90s when five million Afghans fled Afghanistan, where the level of violence and conflict was at least 10 times higher than at any point in the last 10 years, you would have returned to a sectarian conflict between Uzbeks, Tajiks, Pashtuns for dominance in the society. Um, the Pakistan would have supported the Taliban, as it's doing anyway, but it would have supported them in a decisive way without the counterbalancing of American power. The Taliban would have become the dominant force in the country, although probably not controlling all of it. The Taliban remains today allied with Al Qaeda, with close links with Al Qaeda, and so Al Qaeda would again have been able to reestablish itself. The United States would not be flying drone strikes. It would not be taking out terrorists because it wouldn't have any place to base those assets. So I think it's pretty easy to to say what would have happened in Afghanistan if we'd simply conducted our punitive uh, attack on Taliban, routed them, and then uh, and then uh, left the country. Uh, Jian Raj, um, are those the missions we should be fighting? Should we be stopping genocide, uh, stopping sectarian violence? Or yeah, um, one should not take from my talk um, uh, an isolationist view, right? I mean, maybe we should. Um, be involved in those kinds of things. But what we should ask ourselves at the beginning is what will the cost of military intervention be? What are the, what's the likelihood of success? Um, and, and have a real honest discussion of what it will cost. And in so applying military force and the process of doing that, which produces actions, reactions, counteractions, um, Will the, will the process of using military force, um, would it have been worth it in the first place when we talk about this decision whether or not um, to go in? I, I also think that we have to be, there has come to be almost this rule that says when the United States intervenes militarily for whatever reason, the rule says that it has to stay and fix it. And I think that is a very dangerous proposition. If that's the case, it certainly seems to me it commits the United States to perpetual never-ending wars of nation building like we've, been, like we've done in Iraq and we're continuing to do in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Please. Look, I mean, I, I tend to view coin a little like you know, nuclear weapons. It, it, it's something that we, we, we need to have as part of the arsenal, but we... You know, given its cost, we shouldn't be out using it all that often. Um, and I, you know, just following up on what what Ambassador Dobbins w w was talking about with regard to you know the, the early period in the Afghan War, and we also look at at the the early period in Iraq, um, we seriously underballed the cost uh, by by thinking you could you could engage in these sort of um, not just changing the regime, but, but trying to build a more stable new uh, administration in countries like that and do some modest reconstruction with, 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 with the light footprint. And, and you can't do that. And um, I, I, think, I think Iraq and Afghanistan are, 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 are clear lessons uh, of that argument. And, uh, but if you do, you, these, these sorts of interventions are incredibly expensive um, and and costly in terms of of lives as well and uh, it is incumbent to to, uh, to to have that that honest discussion up front as opposed to trying to go in with the small footprint uh, trying to, to convince the American people that you can do this on the cheap when I think um, if there's an enduring lesson from, from both of these endeavors, it's that it can't be done on the cheap and you have to have an honest discussion about the cost. That All that said, I don't think we should look at, um, at, at, at a nation building skill set and say, 
because these things are expensive, because we hope we will never have to fight another land war in Asia again, we should just not um, train, we should not develop that capacity. I think it, it is an important capacity to, to have. Uh, I think that, that there's a danger, particularly among the civilian agencies in our government, a narrative taking hold that the civilian surge in both Iraq and Afghanistan worked brilliantly. Uh, I think the truth is far from that, and there needs to be an honest lessons learned process on the non-military side of our government. Um, and and a, a capacity that is further built up and refined, and one I hope we'll never have to use, but one that we have there on the cupboard if necessary. Could I, could I just add? Mm, yeah, I agree entirely with both these speakers that we need not only an honest debate before we engage in these kinds of interventions, but a well-informed debate and an, and, a, and, an, and an effort to accurately predict the likely costs. If we'd done that it, before we went into Iraq, we would not have invaded Iraq. The American people yep. would never have... Uh, sanctioned the invasion of Iraq if they'd had any idea what it was likely to cost and achieve. Uh, if we'd had that kind of debate in uh, October of 2001, we would have gone into Afghanistan sure. anyway. Sure. And we wouldn't have been wrong right. to do so. Sure. It's also not true that these operations are always costly. Um, the fact is we didn't lose a single person in Haiti. We didn't lose a single uh, soldier uh, in, or airman in Kosovo. We didn't lose a single soldier in Bosnia. Um, uh, I told about 20 uh, international interventions since 1989, 16 of which produced enduring peace. Most of those took no casualties and spent very little money. I, just a quick to, to what Rajiv said. I, I think sometimes, too, um, we make too much of this notion of special skills required to do these, these kinds of operations, um, especially at the small unit level, um, because... They, they really, a, a well-trained military unit can do these kinds of operations. But with this ongoing focus on lessons learned, figuring out what we did wrong tactically in Iraq or Afghanistan, it takes the, the important attention away from what's most important in these kinds of wars. And it's not the tactics of doing them. These, this idea of special skills and special generals it's what Ambassador Dobbin said, especially at the beginning of these wars, the strategy and the policy that puts them into place in the first place. That's what Iraq and Afghanistan, in my view, has turned on. And not whether or not the Army didn't have Field Manual 3-24 in 2003 in Iraq instead of 2006. Okay, we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, please uh, state your question in the form of a question. Please give your name and affiliation and wait for the microphone to come to you. Uh, the gentleman on the far right here uh, in the back. Yes, for the time, yeah. Hello, um, my name is Ogab Malik. Um, recently arrived in Washington. I'm an assistant professor at National Defense University, Islamabad. Um, and currently... Uh, 2013 fellow at SAIS uh, on the South Asia program. My doctoral research was on Afghanistan, uh, just for context. I agree that there's been a lot of problems, um, and I'm going to put this in a, co a form of a, a question as well. Um, there was a dire lack of understanding of Afghan society, the linkages between tribes, power bases, and how, for example, Karzai is utilizing different tribal bases, tribal families, uh, ethnic groups, to maintain himself. So it's not a bad thing in itself that he's trying to do that, to maintain power in the country. And any, any, any leader would want to do that. It's definitely done here, but it's the same dynamic overall. I find that the United States, as I said earlier, direly misunderstood Afghan society. Reform in a quick manner does not work. It's been the case in the 1920s. It was a case during Soviet invasion when they tried to, <coughs> tried to implement drastic reforms and, in, in, in fact, disaffected a large section of the population, which resulted in the war as well. And this was the case again. Culturally sensitive approaches are more appropriate rather than implementing Western-orientated um, actions, for example, or models in, in that case. But more importantly, what will happen in the future? Um, things have gone wrong. What will happen in the future? Will it fall into a civil war, like you, like you said? And is that good for society in Afghanistan or neighboring nations as well? So, uh, 
country specific context, operating in a different culture, different environment, with different values, different norms. Um, is that something that you noticed also in your in your uh, research of these various uh, countries, Ambassador Dobbins, in terms of adapting, uh, you know, international standards of you know gender equality, uh, economic and monetary policies in these various countries? I think I think some understanding of local cultures is obviously very important. But again, mm. just, just going back to this, I, I don't want to keep harping on the study we did of twenty different. Um, the, the the purpose of that study was to determine what kind of local cultural and ethnographic and other factors influence the outcomes in these 20 different interventions and, uh, and levels of success. And, you know, was it the homogeneity of the population or lack of homogeneity? Was it the tribal or, or uh, clan makeups? Uh, all of those things. And we found out that, um, that, that most of those had no, uh, uh, no correlation with outcomes. Uh, that uh, that uh, that the things that had most correlation with outcomes were um, first of all whether the intervention took place on the basis of a peace agreement and and a, and a peacekeeping or whether it it took place on the basis of an invasion that that was all, that was one of the two you know dominant uh, differentiators if you will but the other two factors were basically one. Could you, could you convert neighboring countries from malign to benign policies? If neighboring countries would stop supporting contesting factions, stop feeding the conflict, put convergent pressures on indigenous actors to come together rather than to, to, to fight, um, you almost always succeeded. So geopolitics was more important than sort of cultural sensitivity. It was getting the neighboring uh, uh, the neighboring uh, countries to stop uh, feeding the conflict and begin adopting benign, helpful policies. And the second was co-opting the contending patronage uh, uh, networks in the country into collaboration. They'd still be patronage networks. They'd still be seeking rents. They'd still be extracting wealth from the society, but they wouldn't be killing each other to do it. Now, in some societies, these patronage networks are organized tribally, in some uh, by basis of religion, in some cases geographically, in some cases in other sectarian or religious uh, uh, affiliations define these patronage networks. But if you get the patronage networks to stop killing each other and enter into some sort of uh, 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 collaboration, um, again, you almost always produce peace, and peace almost always leads to some degree of economic growth uh, and improvement in the life of the citizens. Just a quick, I agree with uh, what Ambassador Dobbins just said. I mean, that, I mean, that's the point that I'm making. And these, uh, these wars, like Iraq, Afghanistan, really turn not, for, because like in the American military now, this whole notion of cultural understanding, is, is, it's almost become weaponized. It's the idea that if, if, if cultural understanding is like a weapon, and at the platoon, company, battalion level, if you understand the local culture or whatever and all of that involves, then somehow at that level you'll be successful and you'll produce a better or a good war. But these wars don't turn on those kinds of things. They turn on the issues that the ambassador just mentioned. And then I think for the United States, of course, within all that, we should be asking the fundamental question of whether or not it's our interest um, at the beginning of it to intervene in those very things in the first place. Great. Uh, just to dovetail with that, um, if we're going to take sort of a cold-hearted realist approach and look exclusively at U.S. interests, uh, wouldn't it be best for terrorists to have haven in failed states, in failed governments. Uh, we wouldn't want terrorists to congregate in Pakistan or Malaysia or in Germany. We would want a Somalia. We would want a Yemen. We would want an Afghanistan. So should we be changing our approach to failed states and to ungoverned spaces? No. Um, <laughs> you, know, you, you, want, you, want, you, want, you want terrorists to congregate in areas where there are effective governments that can suppress their activity. You don't want them to be left free to organize. And you particularly don't want them to be left free to use the organs of the state, its diplomatic pouch, its passports, its banking system, freely. 
Um, the reason it's better to have al-Qaeda in Pakistan than in Afghanistan is because in Pakistan, they're not actually allied with the Pakistani government. The Pakistani government, while it is supporting the Taliban, is not supporting al-Qaeda. It's prepared to collaborate with us in suppressing al-Qaeda. It's prepared to give us targets that we can strike with drones. It's prepared to pick up al-Qaeda. People, basically, they're prepared to go out for Arabs. They're just not prepared to go over after Afghans. And so, uh, and so it, it, you know, it, what you don't want you know, the problem with Afghanistan is before al-Qaeda had hijacked three aircraft in the United States, they'd hijacked a whole country and a government, and it was called Afghanistan, and that's what you don't want to replicate. Anyone else? Well, you know, just, just building on that, I totally agree, but in, the, in, in taking it to then the whole surge debate in Afghanistan, you know, the argument advanced by the military was that you had to build up an Afghan state that would be strong enough, right. uh, a government strong enough with security forces strong enough to resist uh, the return of, of, of al-Qaeda uh, operatives from Pakistan to Afghanistan. And if, if we didn't surge and didn't pour in all those resources, then the then the significant elements of al-Qaeda would come pouring back into Afghanistan. And I think what we've seen is that that's a bit of a fallacy. Uh, Al-Qaeda might do completely irrational things, but at their core, uh, they are rational actors. And if the cost of doing business in Afghanistan is incrementally higher than it is in Pakistan, uh, they're not going to come back in large numbers. And while, yes, the Pakistani government does take actions against them uh, and and does provide us with intelligence, I th- you know, it's certainly for, 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 for those who are still around, um, Pakistan has been a more hospitable place for them to operate than in Afghanistan. And to, to keep the, the cost up in Afghanistan didn't require 100,000 U.S. troops. Uh, you know, a, 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 a couple of special forces, or special operations task forces, uh, coupled with, with other sorts of assets, could probably have, have uh, made the cost of doing business in Afghanistan incrementally greater than in Pakistan, dissuading significant numbers of them from crossing back over the border. That, that's true as long... We can stop doing counterinsurgency in Afghanistan and only do counterterrorism as long as the Afghan government does successful counterinsurgency. So we're, it's not that counterinsurgency doesn't work in Afghanistan. It's, it's too expensive to do with Americans. A million, do, a, you know, a million dollars you know, per American is just too much. And so we're going to do it more cheaply. And then the Afghans can triage and figure out which parts of the country it makes sense for them to tackle first uh, and with, with, with American support as opposed to us doing it entirely for them. Right. My point, just really quickly, is why did it take us, what, from 2002 to today, 11, 12 years to figure that out? Well, you didn't have an Afghan government in 2002 that could have done it. For the next question, I must emphasize concision. Um, so uh, the gentleman in the back who had his hand raised, oh, right, right there, yes, who's standing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, uh, Gordon Johnson, my only experience in your arena is post-military working in the Marshall Plan, <laughs> which is a very different situation. Very much. But my question is you haven't talked about the, the perhaps the biggest difficulty that we created for ourselves in setting a deadline when we would leave. If we're going to go in, the calculation should seem to be, require support of the local people. If Vietnam is the lesson for the local people, we're going to leave them before we, we're going to leave any of our, any people who support us, we're going to leave before we should. Bush had a terrible time with the Democrats saying, you've got to get out, you've got to get out. Um, and, and in a sense, how can you negotiate with the Taliban if you tell them you're going to leave in 2014 when the only thing they care about is when are you going to leave? So if you're going to get support of the local, if you're going to get the support of the local people, we cannot set a deadline to leave. But if we don't set a deadline to leave, how do we take care of the American people? And it goes back to, again, Vietnam and the minister in Williamsburg who asked Lyndon Johnson, tell me, why are we there? And isn't therefore a requirement to not only get the support, to get the support of the local people, we have to explain to the American people better do a job of why we are there in order to get, in order not to have to give them a deadline to get out. But that deadline to get out seems to me have been one of our biggest mistakes. So I guess a twofold question, the deadline and also speaking to two audiences, both the folks who live under the host, the host nation government and also the American people. I, I don't um, comment on a couple of those things. 
I don't um, compared to Vietnam the at least in a in a in a moral way the American people are not connected to these wars um, because and they were during the Vietnam War because there was a draft I'm not personally I don't think the draft is the answer I think a much more less ambitious foreign policy and a foreign policy that's premised on the notion of limits to what American military power can accomplish um, I think that is the answer so I don't think at least um, over these last 10 years of war, that the American people have been morally connected to these two, two wars like they were with regard to Vietnam. Your, your other point about um, time and how long these kinds of wars take, I, you're, if, you're right. I mean, a, a rational strategy that sought to use armed nation building or counterinsurgency to achieve, if that's to achieve a policy aim, then a rational strategy would say and come out front and be honest about it that if we're going to apply armed nation building to keep al-Qaeda at bay in Afghanistan, then it is going to take a long time. And it's not going to take 18 months or eight years or 18 years. We're talking about a multi-generational effort. But then my point in my talk all along was that if, if we're doing strategy right the way I explained it, and if, especially with regard to Afghanistan, we have this very, very limited core policy aim, which is the destruction of al-Qaeda, which was pretty much accomplished by early 2002. Why did we need to put in place this huge operational framework that committed us to a decade of war, trillions in blood and treasure, to achieve that very core, uh, limited core policy aim? That is why I think our strategy from the beginning has been botched. So, first of all, we're not... We're not leaving Afghanistan. The president has committed himself not to withdrawal, but to a drawdown. And he's committed himself to leave some residual American troop presence there uh, uh, after 2015 and beyond uh, in order to uh, support, enable, train um, Afghan forces. In 2002, Afghanistan had no army and no police force. Today, it has an army of 350,000 men. It has a police force of about 250,000 men. Um, and... Uh, by regional standards, they're not, uh, they're not bad. Um, the, it, it's a question whether they can, with a, a minimal American commitment of, uh, of training and, uh, and financial support, um, uh, continue to resist the Taliban. Um, but unlike uh, Vietnam, uh, Pakistan's not going to invade uh, Afghanistan. Um, in Vietnam, the U.S. left. The, at the South Vietnamese government didn't fall. Then we cut off all financial and military assistance, and it fell. But it fell largely because North Vietnam invaded, not because an indigenous insurgency overthrew them. Um, and that's not going to happen in Afghanistan. It, we can all agree that uh, it, it's, it's a very high likelihood that we're not leaving Afghanistan and there'll be residual presence there. Uh, pardon some Afghans, though, for being a little confused on this when you know White House officials raise the possibility publicly of a zero troop option uh, and uh, you know options are put forth of you know maybe just a few hundred troops post 2014 um, that ambiguity that uh, that exists here uh, in the policy debate um, gets multiplied several fold over as it echoes across um, uh, the world um, but but back to, so two other quick points you know um, the, the way you build public support, is you, is you talk about these wars. I mean, uh, political leaders aren't talking about Afghanistan. I mean, you look at the, two, the, the, uh, the 2012 campaign. I mean, neither Obama nor Romney said much about this war. Um, if you want to try to build some public support for it, you, you at least have to hit the hustings. And, you know, Bush talked about Iraq a lot. But remember, in the early days, post 9-11, we were all uh, told, uh, you know, to go shopping as the best thing to do to, to help uh, support the uh, 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 the, the, the effort, uh, the fight against terrorism. Um, uh, but, um, you know, just with regard to the, the deadline and the specific of the question, uh, specific question, you know, there is, uh, look, if you, if you want to mount up a full on comprehensive counterinsurgency campaign, yeah, a deadline's a, it doesn't make sense. It's, it's totally counterproductive. But let's say you're a president, a young president who is very skeptical of a counterinsurgency uh, strategy, doesn't really want to surge, um, but is kind of feels boxed in by his military commanders who don't really give him much of another option. So, but recognizes that 
To get to the point where you get the Afghans doing the counterinsurgency fight themselves, you need to create a little white space. You need to beat back the Taliban. Um, and then you can move to a security force assistance mission. Then perhaps um, a deadline makes sense. And you say, all right, military, uh, you want to go fight this coin fight? Well, I'll let you go and do it because what it is going to do over the short term is going to beat back the insurgents. And then I can... Um, um, push you to uh, shift the focus of the mission, perhaps faster than you might otherwise want, uh, to get to a point where we have fewer American boots on the ground. Looked at that way, then a deadline perhaps becomes a little bit more rational. Uh, wow, so many to choose from. Uh, uh, ben Friedman in the far back. Oh, the gentleman behind him. Sorry. Uh, ben Friedman from Cato. Um, I uh, agree that uh, counterterrorism doesn't necessarily require uh, counterinsurgency, but once we're doing counterinsurgency, why is it the case that we think, it seems to me in the United States, that there's one model? Um, mm -hmm. It seems like in the history of uh, mm -hmm. counterinsurgency, not just in the United States, but around the world, there's actually a lot of different models, many of which involve co-opting insurgents, uh, like in Pakistan, where there's regions of the country, or even in India, where there's regions of the country that in the past have had fair amounts of autonomy, where they're rebels, or would be rebels. And uh, it seems to me that what we in the United States have done in these two wars is actually not necessarily always consistent with state building. And to the extent we've been successful, it often involves co-opting insurgents by buying them off, or as with the Kurds, just letting them have a big chunk of the country so they don't become insurgents in the first place. Uh, and uh, Afghanistan, it seems to me, is, uh, I'm not an expert on Afghanistan, but particularly ill-suited for a traditional monopolization of violence, uh, build out the central state type model. It seems to me that actually makes us more like a revolutionary power than a counter-revolutionary power because we're overthrowing local authority structures and arguably creating resistance to the central state. So why, do you, I mean, when there's, you know, uh, Ambassador Dobbins mentioned this, these 20 countries, uh, 20 uh, efforts, uh, 20 state building efforts. Why is there one model of success or might there be one strategy for Bosnia that's different than the right strategy for Afghanistan, assuming we're there? Uh, I, I think, you know, first of all, the best way of marginalizing extremist groups in an insurgency is, is to support the insurgents, not to counter them, um, if you can afford to do that because there's no insurgent in the world that wouldn't rather have American support than Al-Qaeda if he's offered that choice. Uh, and so we have supported Muslim insurgencies in Bosnia, in Kosovo. Uh, we supported a Muslim insurgency in uh, Afghanistan in 2001. We, the, the insurgents were the side we were on in Afghanistan. Um, we supported uh, uh, Muslim insurgents in Iraq in uh, the Iraq awakening. Uh, by co-opting the Iraqi insurgents, the Sunni insurgents, and offering them protection. So yes, I mean, that's certainly a very viable tactic. There are cases in which you can't afford to do that or because the, or where the insurgents won't, uh, won't come over. We offered the Taliban the option of, of handing over bin Laden after the 9-11 attack, in which case we promised not to attack them, not to invade the country, and not to overthrow them, and they refused to do it. So. That option didn't work in that particular case. More generally, I, I, I expect uh, uh, John and I will disagree somewhat on the utility. I mean, a, a successful counterinsurgency requires a variety of different uh, tactical and, and strategic approaches. You have to put a lot of different things in place to, to have success. Obviously, it is differentiated from, from society to society and situation to situation uh, to some degree. Um, but uh, but the successful counterinsurgency uh, practices tend to run in packs. They tend to coalesce, and when they do coalesce appropriately, they usually succeed. Uh, and bad practices usually lead to failure if they're pursued um, uh, if they're pursued continuously. A couple of just quick points to to Ben, and then what the ambassador said. Um, you can't. You can't find a historical case where American-style counterinsurgency, namely Field Manual 3-24, which is the same thing as armed state building. I mean, it is. I mean, the lines of effort within Field Manual 3-24 are about 
building local governance, national governance, the economy, infrastructure, military forces, all those kinds of things. You, you can't find a case in history where armed nation, this kind of counterinsurgency carried out by a foreign occupying power has worked. It's not the reason why the British were successful in Malaya. The United States lost in Vietnam because it failed its strategy. Um, nor can you use this kind of counterinsurgency to explain why, or be, uh, to use it as the main causative factor as to why violence um, dropped in Iraq by the end of, of 2007. Um, I, the, the premise, Ben, to your, your question, who is, I think, an important one, because there are different ways of countering an insurgency. Um, and I agree with the ambassador that there should be a variety of tasks or techniques or methods that the United States has when it decides that it is going to use military force to counter an insurgency. The problem with American counterinsurgency today, as it was laid out in Field Manual 3-24, which became elevated all the way up to the level of strategy policymakers were using its language, is that there really isn't any variety there's only one way to go about doing it. That's sort of the operational method. I mean, this is what Rajiv was talking about, right? I mean, that is, for the American military in 2009, when there was a legitimate or there, there was an attempt at a strategic debate in Afghanistan, there really wasn't a debate at all. This is one of the main points he brings out in his excellent book, Little America. And there wasn't a debate because there was only one way to go about achieving the core policy aim. And that was American counterinsurgency premised on the idea that General Petraeus and the surge of troops made it work in Iraq. So this, this is the problem that we have here. If strategy is going to look at problems in the world, and maybe we do want to use military force to counter an insurgency or deal with instability or whatever, at least the way it is now, we don't have a, a variety of methods. We only have one. And it's called American counterinsurgency, a.k.a. armed nation building. Yeah, I mean, insurgencies were countered using effective counterinsurgency techniques in the Philippines in the 1950s, in El Salvador in the 1980s, uh, in Colombia more recently. Um, by and large, the kind of uh, techniques and tactics that are described in the American Field Manual were consistent with those campaigns. They weren't, connected they weren't conducted dominantly by Americans, but they were supported and advised by Americans. Great. Um, the gentleman who initially stood up the first time. Hi, Bob Shadler. Thank you very much. Um, you demonstrate uh, impressively being informed, highly intelligent, but I would like to ask you to address a different framework. Uh, we the people were on board for the first Afghan war because of three very obvious specific things. 9-11, a determination that bin Laden and his associates were responsible for 9-11, and as was just mentioned, the Taliban government refused to give them up. So our, the, the mission of the first Afghan war, I would suggest, was to kill or capture bin Laden and his closest associates. That war ended when he left Afghanistan, and or, and or when we realized he left. The second Afghan war began immediately afterwards and that was to diffuse our embarrassment of having utterly failed. And so all of this about counterinsurgency and phone usage in Afghanistan and girls learning to read were not why we the people went into Afghanistan. And we would be just as happy barely being able to spell Afghanistan and having only a few specialists know where it is. But it was that purpose and once that purpose was lost because he left, we, had, we were fumbling around. So building up a central government or improving life there was not something we the people signed on for. It was to kill or capture Afghanistan, and the government continues to avoid embarrassment by staying there. Can no, we, we didn't. We didn't invade Germany in order to turn it into the most prosperous country in Western Europe. We didn't invade Japan 
uh, in order to make it a prosperous democracy um, and uh, a, a major export power. Um, but we did both of those things very consciously in the aftermath of the war uh, because we didn't want either of those countries to return in one case to Nazism and in the other case to militarism. And we were quite successful. The reason we stayed on in Afghanistan was so that the Taliban wouldn't return, so that Al Qaeda wouldn't return, and also, incidentally, so that we'd have a base to attack Al Qaeda in Pakistan. Well, um, the threat from the Taliban certainly isn't on the level of, of no, I, Nazi Germany or Imperial Japan. They're not implying that, right? From your I, well, I'm implying that that you that that you you always go into a war to stop something. You, you never go into a war for a for a positive outcome. You go into a war to stop aggression, to stop genocide. Uh, to stop something. And then once you stopped it, you're left with, what do we do now? And the answer is, you want to make sure that the, that, the, that the situation after the war is better than the situation before the war. Otherwise, what was the point? Right now, we're at a point where we're going to be engaging the Taliban in terms of broader reconciliation uh, in the Afghan government. That's something that wasn't necessarily even an option uh, after we invaded uh, Germany. That was certainly one of our mistakes, not to have done that a lot earlier. I, but I think you can also, I mean, there's some really big differences between, obviously, between World War II um, and Afghanistan. Um, the the overall global threat um, uh, that was there in World War II um, with fascism and Nazism. And I think you can also look to World War II as a historical example where strategy made sense and worked, where you had unconditional surrender as the policy objective and then a very elaborate and well thought through and generally well executed by all the allies, Soviet Union, the United States, Great Britain, and others to achieve that policy aim. I, I mean, I think with Afghanistan... Absolutely, we were right to go in and and hammer um, Al Qaeda and the Taliban for their support of, of Al Qaeda. Um, and then, I mean, I agree with a lot of the points that you made. Um, we we achieved our objective uh, fairly quickly, and so by 2002, there's relatively speaking only a handful of Al Qaeda fighters left in Afghanistan. So now we're back to this basic again question of strategy: What does it take? to keep after that core policy objective and whether or not we needed to stay and fix and build in order to achieve it. We, we have to also understand that the cost of staying, fixing, and building right. in 2002 and 2003 were exponentially less right. than they were in 2009 and 10. And had we committed... Um, more resources than we did, but but nothing on the order of, of today. Mm. Um, we wouldn't be having this discussion today. I mean, had 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 Washington listened to to, to, to people like Ambassador Dobbins, among others, um, and more properly resourced uh, uh, some some basic state building, some basic training of Afghan security forces, mm. uh, some basic peacekeeping uh, efforts in major cities. Uh, and, and mind you, back then, much of the burden would have been distributed among our NATO partners um, and others. Uh, it would be a, 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 a far different discussion. And, um, you know, but, that. you know, when you get to 2009, mm. you know, it may just it may not be that there are two Afghan wars. It's probably more like there are three. The, you know, the initial 2001 period, then the sort of period of, of of drift that goes from you know 2002 late late 02 to to to, to early 09, um, and then the, the decision to sort of recommit. And by that point, um, the, the the cost of of getting there was was so much greater, and and, and that's when. They're, they're really needed, in my view, to have been a, uh, a even more substantive argument over, well, yes, you know, it would be great to have a functioning Afghan state. Uh, you don't want ungoverned spaces because of, 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 of you know, what, what that uh, uh, potentially uh, yields in terms of uh, you know, bad actors operating in those areas. Um, but, but is the cost-benefit analysis, which, which probably could have been very easily calculated back in 2002 and come out in the positive, um, by 2009, uh, the cost, at least to me, seemed to be, be, be far, far too great. Oh, sadly, with that, uh, we've actually gone over time, uh, substantially over time. But I'd like to thank all of the speakers here on the dais with me today. Thank you.
Ambassador Dobbins, the Chief Secretary, and Roger Taylor. Thank you very much.